He's recording, oh, really? so oh. <laughs> now you tell me when you're okay. ready. Okay, um, recording is started, um, and I see that confirmed, so I'll give you guys a countdown, and then I'll disappear. Here we go, five, four, three. Very good. Um, why don't we get this meeting underway? Sorry for the slight delay. Uh, so we'll call this meeting to order. It is 3.06 p.m. Today is May 12, 2020. Uh, we are once again holding this as an electronic special board meeting. So I want to remind everybody uh, that all community members and non-participating staff are kind of automatically muted. You're not able to join with your uh, comments until somebody promotes you. Those who are participating in the meeting, please do remind, remember to mute yourselves uh, when you're not speaking so that we don't get all the echoes. And I think uh, most of you are, uh, I don't have to repeat it, but wave your hands at me. It looks like the screens are a little bit bigger, so it won't be quite as stressful on me. Um, and then the other reminder we have is just, uh, there is a bit of a delay between when you when they call on you and when you actually can be heard. So with that, why don't we get this meeting underway? And Jill, I'm assuming you're somewhere back there in the background. Would you please do a roll call at this time? Yes, board members, DJ, DJ Anderson, is here. Nate Donovan, Donovan is here. Kristen Draper. Christoph Fev. Oh. Uh, here, Christoph is here. Kristen, can we hear your vote? Kristen Draper? Sorry, your roll call. Okay, I see her wave. Okay, we'll come back. She Naomi fixed. Johnson. Naomi is here. Rob Pedersen. Rob is here. Bonifier. Carolyn Reed. Cabinet members, Sandra Smyzer. Sandra is here. Autumn Aspen. Autumn is here. Matt Bryant. Matt is here. Todd Lambert. Todd is here. Dave Montoya. Scott Nielsen. Scott is here. Madeline Noblet. Here. Dustin Reinsma. Dustin is here. Vicki Thompson. Vicki is here. And Kristen Draper, we'll try you one more time. Kristen Draper? I'm here. Awesome. That's roll. Very good. Thank you, Jill. Okay, uh, next up is approval of the agenda. And board members, would anybody like to make any changes to the agenda this evening? Okay, Nate, okay. go right ahead. Yes, I would move to amend the agenda to include an action item uh, for the possibility of sending a communication to the governor and members of the legislature, the state legislature, uh, regarding the Colorado state budget. Okay, very good. And what I propose to call that, uh, just so we're clear, is that that would be action item 5.2, and I was going to call that a resolution regarding state funding to support education. That's fine. I was going to uh, right have it take the form of a letter, but resolution is fine as well. It, it captures it. Okay. Okay, very good. So did, did everybody understand that? 
Okay, do I have a second for that motion? I got a second from DJ Anderson. Uh, may I have a roll call vote? On DJ Anderson? DJ votes aye. Nate, Nate Donovan, Donovan votes aye. Chris Draper votes aye. Christoph Fev. Naomi, Naomi Johnson votes aye. Rob Pedersen. Rob votes aye. Carolyn Reed. Carolyn votes aye. Motion passes 7 0. Good. And actually, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I don't know if I was supposed to ask if there were any other changes. But um, just to be clear, are there any other proposed changes to the agenda at this point? Okay. So seeing none, uh, we have added an item, which is 5.2, into the action items. Otherwise, the agenda is as shown and published. Okay, uh, very good. Next up, we have given ourselves some our, some time for board discussion. So that's item 3.0 on the agenda. And I'm just going to open it up to any board members who might like to uh, bring up any subjects, talk about committees, um, agenda items that you have in mind. So as we're coming to the end of the school year, um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about how we're going to be celebrating those big changes um, and the graduations and such. And I have heard from a lot of families about how just incredibly thrilled they were to get signs delivered to their homes from teachers and coaches and lots of other people who were involved in their education and just that representation of how much people care, even from afar, that was brought into their front yards. Um, I heard that there were a lot of really beautiful moments shared at at least six feet of distance and lots of happy tears. So just thank you to all of the teachers and administrators and coaches and sponsors who went out and helped to um, you know, bridge that gap of celebrating our graduating students. DJ, can you unmute yourself? We, we're not hearing a word you're saying. OK, how about that? Uh, OK, so I, I'm jumping on the, the sign thing and, and want to share with everyone about how happy uh, it made my high school senior. Uh, she had gotten a couple signs uh, from her high school about uh, Technical Honor Society and graduating, and uh, but this last one that just showed up uh, yesterday really, really made her uh, extremely happy. It was a personalized one where they put their senior photo in it. Uh, I think she was feeling a little jealous with the fifth grader across the street, who uh, the fifth graders had personal ones with their photos, and but she was she was overjoyed to uh, get that. It, it did bring a big smile to her face, which uh, she's been pretty disappointed with a lot of unfortunate things ending and uh, not being able to celebrate them. So I'll share that too. Yeah, fantastic. I'm seeing those all around my neighborhood too. They, they look really nice. So other uh, board members, need other topics? People want to put it on the floor. The agenda. Did you items. also say you wanted to do our community or our uh, committee talk right now too? 
Was that a yes? Okay. Uh, I give you a, a little update on if you want to if you want to report on, on the foundation. Um, the foundation when it went and voted for two uh, new members to join the foundation board. Uh, to try to grow that a little bit. We're still, uh, it, it is still a, an operation, unfortunately, though, really just kind of treading water right now, trying to figure out its place. And uh, and since the hiring freeze of uh, not looking at getting, a, uh, hiring a executive director either right now, it's kind of just kind of hanging out there a little bit right now. But they did grow the board to try to, help relieve some of the work that we're trying to do and help make sure we had a treasurer and, and some stuff like that. Uh, and then I also wanted to just kind of jump in a little bit with, uh, we're going to talk about this in a lot of different ways, but the, the financial uh, situation that our state is in. Uh, so our legislative committee did have a, a nice, uh, meeting, and we talked a lot about how there isn't, uh, our state is going to take a huge hit. We learned today that it's, they're looking at more of a 3.3 .3 billion uh, deficit that they got to figure out about. And unfortunately, that's really going to be um, really tough for education, along with everything else that's in the state budget. Uh, but with the state backfilling uh, our our education funding, it, it really puts a, a a not very happy look for our future. And so we we talked as a legislative group about different things that we could do, and a couple of those are going to come up on our action items. Um, and and I just want to make sure that you know there are uh, things that we can take on the outside, and we can make sure we can. Uh, do as a group and, and the differences that it can make. Um, I uh, was on the phone today with a uh, representative of uh, Congressman Joe Nagus, and the importance that I got from that conversation is that uh, even our congressmen, they, you know, our, our CASB is working with the National School Board Association. But the thing that I was told from them is, you know, Joe really looks at what comes out of our, our congressional district. And if, if he hears from school boards or the Colorado uh, Association, it has a little bit more weight for him. And some things like that can really help us, you know, get different messages out there. And this is kind of what we talked about in our meeting. And we wanted to do this these resolutions and then put a letter with it with our ask. And it's it's so important, I think, right now that we get out and 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 make this ask as soon as we can. Um, there are so many different organizations that are out there standing up and asking for help, uh, and, and some maybe warrant it more than others. But there are definitely groups out there that have stronger voices to do it, and unfortunately, our I'm learning more and more that our education voices don't seem to want to get together and uh, form a strong coalition uh, and, and make that that ask. But we, we need to, I think, even in our local roles, make sure that we're trying to get together and, and make it clear that we're not just um, asking for more money in, you know, out there. We, we need to also make sure we're, we're defining a little bit. The uh, the part of um, that I have recommended, uh, along with what you'll see in this re recommendation, is uh, there are certain asks for that general fund that uh, I think is important that we could get our state legislators talking to our governor and then talking to our uh, federal government. The whole idea is that we need. I think we need money that's going to be there for a couple of years. Um, and, you know, even if they could give us something to stretch it out, and we've talked a little bit about one-time money and how we could stretch it out, 
Uh, I wonder if there's something that we could ask for as a, um, uh, I called it a car loan. So it's, it's in the idea of, you know, give us an interest-free loan that we don't have to pay back for another five years or six years to get us through this and we can stair-step it. Um, you know, there, there are outrageous out-of-the-box ideas that I think need to be shared and, and throughout there. I think, of course, you know, what um, CASB and the National School Board Association has is good, too, you know, in, in helping our IDEA funding and uh, the E-rate fund, which can help with our back, uh, the backbone of our communication and, and infrastructure aspect. Um, so I, I just want to give us that kind of background a little bit about when we start talking about this and some of the stuff that was mentioned uh, for that federal one. For our local one, uh, to me, the biggest thing that we can do is, is promote and ask that they refer uh, Initiative 271. Uh, it, is, it is not a fix, um, but it is a, a way to help us get money into the system. Before all this hit, it was figured that it would bring in $2 billion, and $1 billion of that would go to education. Um, with income taxes going to be lower, I think those numbers would have to be adjusted some, but it still would be a big portion to help us as education. And I would like to see it referred, and at that point, at least get that conversation going, and hopefully we could apply some pub public pressure on a few of the senators we would need to get that referred, and at least give the voters an option to do it. The second thing that is pretty big with our local legislators is, you know, there are certain funds out there that they did not, or let me put it this way, uh, CSI, Charter School Institute, had, has had good pressure on them, so they did not pull some of those fundings. And I think the Charter School, uh, School Institute No Levy Equalization Fund and Capital Fund are two funds that, that do need to be pulled. I really think they probably will be now that the, the budget um, forecast has come out and how huge it is. But I think we do need to make sure we're stating these things clearly that we would want from our local legislators. Because um, it, it is a time to stand up and not just wait for bills to come out, but time for us to make our voices heard as one. And I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay, great. Thank you, DJ. Any other board members wanting to chime in at this time? Okay. Um, Okay, I'm not sure what's, are we still live? I think so. All right. <laughs> um, so just, uh, I was going to quickly throw out the uh, DAB would like to join us at our next meeting and was requesting that we give them a slot um, to be able to, to speak, do their annual report. I think that's a to, um, just a written report, but they asked for for your time on our meeting agenda. So we'll discuss that in our uh, agenda setting, but you know, I'm inclined to give them that. And not, the other thing from those guys is uh, they actually asked Scott and Todd and myself whether uh, using their membership to launch a survey with how, how things are going for the school district as everything's gone online and getting any feedback, whether that would be of interest. Um, I found myself being a little cautious and just told them to check in with Scott and Todd to see if they if they thought that would be a, a useful thing, and they seem to give it a thumbs up. So I don't know if we'll be hearing about that survey when they speak next week or at the next meeting, but just. Yeah, I just, uh, as we were talking about the DAB, it, uh, it uh, caused me to think about uh, the relationship to what DJ was saying, and I think we need to see if we can get them involved as well as obviously PEA and and, and our other associations in terms of uh, lobbying. Uh, so I think we need to figure out a way to 
way to get as many voices out there as possible. Okay, great. We'll, we may have to mention that to them. I know they had their last meeting on uh, a week ago, so you're aware of that, but uh, it's a good point. Okay, any other board topics, comments, anything else at this time? Okay, uh, seeing none, I will move us right along. So item 4.0 is the consent agenda. Um, does anybody uh, want to remove anything from consent at this point? Okay, seeing none, I would take a motion for the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a, a shake of the head. We can... Uh, I can read it if you want, yeah. I move that, okay. I move are, are that there, the board approve and adopt the, the recommended agenda? actions for the items on the consent agenda. Go ahead. DJ Anderson. DJ votes aye. Nate Donovan. Nate Donovan votes aye. Kristen Draper Kristen votes Draper. aye. Christoph Bev. Okay. Yes, it did, Nate. Yeah. Naomi Johnson. Naomi Johnson votes aye. Rob Pedersen. Rob votes aye. Carolyn, Carolyn Reed. Motion passes 7 0. Okay, very good. And that brings us to the action items for this evening. Item 5.1 is a resolution regarding federal funding to support the edu uh, support education. And let me start, uh, do we have a motion for that? Sure. I move that the board approve and adopt the resolution regarding federal funding to support education. I think I, I Christoph, Christoph, since that isn't in the packet, I, just I think they only need to read it. And and do we have yeah. That's what I'm wondering about. I was I was double checking whether it was in the packet material. So it is not. So I think we do need somebody to make the motion okay. by reading it, or we can it move it. So uh, we have Naomi read it, and then we'll, you, we can uh, move from there. How do you want to? Yes, that? I will do that right now as you I'm do getting that, ready to read it to everyone. And I'm just going to take a moment and stall for time. And also, uh, then I'm going to read the motion that I have pulled up right here on my computer. I move that the board approve the following resolution for federal funding. Whereas, am I good to go? Whereas COVID-19 has presented our globe with extraordinary challenges and circumstances that affect all residents, <clears throat> excuse me, and whereas our nation, state, and local communities' future well-being relies on a high-quality public education system that prepares all students for college, careers, democracy, and lifelong learning, and whereas educational personnel are often the primary sources of support, resources, and information 
to assist and support student learning and students, which includes their emotional health. And whereas the successful and complete reopening of schools for in-person education is vital to the success of all industries in the U.S., and whereas in the U.S. paying for elementary and secondary education is largely the purview of state and local governments, with the federal government contributing less than 10% of total K-12 education funding nationally, and whereas many state and local governments, including the state of Colorado, have balanced budget requirements or face high borrowing car costs, while the federal government can borrow freely, and whereas school districts, including Poudre School District, need an infusion of federal funds to prevent substantial cuts to their budgets, which have not even recovered from the hit of the 2008 Great Recession, and whereas the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities recently projected overall national budget shortfalls of $350 billion for the 2021 school year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a total that is significantly more than the shortfall at the height of the Great Recession. And whereas Colorado school districts, including Poudre School District, have sustained costs to support students and families amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas Poudre School District is preparing for possible cuts of between 15 million and 28 million, representing overall cuts to its overall budget of between 5 and 10 percent due to anticipated cuts to the state of Colorado budget as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas research shows that the level of funding affects school districts' academic outcomes, especially among a district's most vulnerable students, and whereas the shift to remote education and the likely need to change how schools across the nation and in Poudre School District operate when they do reopen to in-person learning have created new demands on school systems at the same time that economic fallout is impacting their budgets. And whereas the federal government can borrow at historically low interest rates to finance these investments in the nation's children, and whereas an infusion of federal funds would promote two key goals, it would protect children from the harmful effects of deep cuts and promote economic recovery. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Poudre School District Board of Education supports an additional federal allocation of $200 billion to be used to help make school budgets whole for the benefit of our students and communities and be it further resolved that we also urge Congress to provide an additional $13 billion for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, $12 billion in additional Title I program funding, $4 billion for E-rate and emergency infrastructure funds that include public schools. Thank you, Naomi. That was well read. Do I have a second for that motion? I see Nate Donovan uh, has seconded the motion. Okay. Yeah, so I'm uh, obviously uh, very much in favor of this resolution. I further, as I think uh, DJ alluded to earlier, uh, recommend that we, uh, assuming it passes, that we uh, create a uh, cover letter, for lack of a better word, and that the board basically allow the leadership to make that happen. It won't be any more than just reciting a few key points from the resolution and asking them to consider it. Uh, but anyway, and that we get that out as soon as possible um, to our uh, uh, Congress uh, people, uh, Frankly, all the Congress people, and I don't see why we shouldn't send it to all the Congress people in, in Colorado, plus the senators, and for friends, we can send it to uh, President Trump as well. 
Um, let's just get it out there. And then I think, frankly, in addition to sending a, a letter, you know, a physical document, I think we ought to follow up with each of the offices of our local Congress people and uh, senators uh, to uh, emphasize the importance of this in an in-person conversation. Well, in-person as much as we can get these days, you know, virtually in-person. That would be my thinking about how we follow up. But as far as the vote's concerned, there's no question in my mind that we should vote for it. I was just wondering if we should add also sending it to CASB so that it can become um, basically a um, statewide document uh, that people could go ahead and um, fill in the blank um, and also to all the superintendents. I feel like it's one of those documents that could be, uh, you know, coming from one school district is fine, but coming from all 178 school districts in the state of Colorado to our senators and our representatives. Um, I think will be a much stronger resolution. So if we could do that as well. Okay, great comments. I am, um, Rob mentioned having board leadership write a cover letter, as far as getting this distributed, is that something we... Yes, I was just gonna say ditto to what Kristen and Rob said, and I think Rob could write the transmittal letter himself if we wanna go that route. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll write I'll write something, send it out, or or I can work with DJ on it if if you want DJ as the okay. Seems all right. I hit the right button this time. Um, an issue that got brought up to me uh, that maybe we should include in there also besides the money, and I'd love to get Sanders feedback on this is uh, putting something in there about. Uh, uh, I wish I could find the right word. Uh, waiver is what comes to mind, but not necessarily a waiver, but a real to make sure that we are are meeting our IDEA needs and that we uh, are doing the best that we can and that we don't get bit in the butt if somebody gets upset that certain things aren't being met. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing the best we can for those kids, but, uh, you know, if, if unfortunately a certain parent or somebody feels that we are not doing right by them, it could cost us some money, it could cost us time. And so there are different uh, school districts and people asking the government to try to do something about that so that it's covering our covering our backside, really. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if we should put something like that in there, too. Yes. So we have seen some letters from other districts that are trying to make the right tone to that letter, because we don't want to sound like we don't want to take care of children with disabilities. Of course we do but we also don't want to get tangled up in technicalities that can't be accomplished. So I know staff's been working on that. Let me see if we have a draft of something going and then, um, because I know there's been quite a conversation around the state about how's the right way to do that. Um, so let me follow up with that one for you and we'll get something that you all feel comfortable signing. We're, we're not trying to avoid litigation. We're not trying to avoid taking care of kids. We just. Um, but I do know it's a it's a nationwide question, so let me see if I can get you some advice. Right. No, I was just going to reinforce what you were just saying. I think we ought to go with, uh, give, given the sensitive nature of the wording around that, and that the staff's already looking at it, I think we ought to let them 
uh, complete their task on that, uh, get it to us, and uh, depending on the timing, we'll either include a piece of it in the cover letter or we'll send it as another thing, frankly. Uh, but I just want, I want to get this thing out. I don't want to wait for you know, some number of days. So I think that'll work. I just wondered if we wanted to have DJ move to amend so that we can officially have whatever language staff gives us be part of either the resolution or the cover letter or however it's done so that we make sure that we that's part of our vote. Yes. Okay, so Nate, that would be moving to amend, allowing future language to come in from the staff. Would, would Is that, that what you're suggesting? Is that included into the letter aspect of it? If it is, I think that does make a lot of sense that we that we are able to use their information into a letter. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, for the resolution wise, I think it, I see the, the sense of just approving it as it is right now. Thinking the same way, we just need to approve the resolution and I think the letter, cover letter is a separate deal because um, all we're doing is approving this resolution and then we can use it as we see fit. Well, but I, I do want to be clear that we're, if we do a letter that we're doing it from the Board of Education and not just from the committee, the legislative committee or something. So I want to make sure that I have, Rob and I have your approval. Yeah, no, I and 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 I guess just following up on that, I I would like to suggest uh, that you as the board member sign it on behalf it of the be board. A wrapper around uh, the resolution. Because I don't know that we're going to get everybody. Rob, I wanted to get your comment. Difference in here, but in any case, we'll we'll get this we'll get the signature thing worked out as it relates to as it relates to amending. It really depends on how fast the the staff, you know, where the staff is in their process, and I'm not entirely clear on that. Uh, I'm also not, I, I think frankly, if need be, we can do a second motion or letter or resolution around that at the time it's ready. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I suspect that the issues around money and particularly a four, third or fourth or whatever we're on, you know, Coronavirus Relief Act thing is going to be more urgent than whether IDEA gets waived because you can waive IDEA for next year anytime. I, you know, I don't want to dismiss it as unimportant because it is important, but I think that there's more flexibility in the timing, I guess, on that than there is potentially on the on the money. So I I, I have no problem adding it in to the letter if it shows up like tomorrow. Otherwise, I'm going to get that letter done tomorrow. Yeah, I agree. Um, if it can be done fairly soon, that's fine. If not, we'll deal with it later. But I'm assuming that uh, all of this is part of the same discussion and consideration for a vote. Okay. I, I tend to agree with you, Nate. You, 
Yeah, just following up on that uh, comment, uh, I would like to also thank uh, Madeline Noblet and uh, Dave Montoya for their contributions in, in uh, right. the wording and DJ Anderson. Nate Donovan. Nate Donovan votes aye for the what not. Kristen Draper. Kristen Draper votes aye. Christoph Fev. Naomi he Johnson. Votes aye. Rob Pedersen. Carolyn Reed. Carolyn, aye. Rob votes aye. Motion passes 7 0. Okay, very good. Uh, well done. And so that brings us to the newly added action item 5.2. Sure, uh, I, again, I would move that uh, the Hooter School District Board of Education communicate with Governor Jared Polis and the members of the Colorado General Assembly. Um, I had intended that it be a letter, but it could be in a resolution form. It's a little it's a little specific, so that's why I put it in a letter form. Um, but I would propose that we communicate with them. Uh, and there's four main parts to the uh, discussion. So we appreciate that they're going to have a lot of tough decisions to make and thank them for their work on that. And we respectfully ask that you take the following actions as you proceed. The first part is advocate for increased federal funding that specifically allows expenditures by school districts for personnel costs that would otherwise be cut due to anticipated declines in state and local revenues. We realize that the CARES, the CARES Act, may provide some relief but the remaining revenue shortfalls will significantly impact pre-K to 12 education in Colorado and nationwide. So that's the first part is to ask our state officials to help advocate with our federal officials for federal funding. Number two is an ask that the Colorado General Assembly refer to the 2020 general education BAP general election ballot, the Fair Tax Colorado proposal known as initiative number 271, helping reduce cuts to public education, health care, transportation, and other critical state needs. Colorado public schools have been significantly underfunded for years, leading to many unmet needs for our students. This proposal will help in the quest for a long-term structural solution to our inadequate tax system in Colorado. So that's asking them specifically to refer that measure to the ballot in November of 2020. The third one is what DJ was referring to regarding uh, Mill Levy Equalization Fund for the Colorado Charter School Institute. So the proposal is asking them to reduce the Colorado Charter School Institute Mill Levy Equalization Fund to make more general fund dollars available for school finance. This would help mitigate shortfalls in forecasted state revenue available for pre-K to 12 public education. 
That's number three. And then number four is provide Colorado school districts adequate and sustainable funding by maximizing total program funding to pay teachers and staff and provide additional student supports. And then, uh, so that's number four. And then uh, just a summary, thanking them for their consideration and have the Board of Education names on it. And uh, we could just have the president sign it. So I offer those four points for your consideration and hope we can get agreement on some or all of them. And Nate, this is for clarification, not discussion. Um, so you, your correct. motion would be that's correct. To that's the motion, and those I put it in a letter format because letter it was resolution specific actions out, and it would related to specific budget items. In support of that, um, and then sending it out that to the was, appropriate. There was more of a specific ask people. than the general clear, resolution that I had started, started on earlier. Resolution in earlier in the week, right? So but that would be the motion you would make before that. Okay. Okay, do I have a second for the motion as read? I got a second from Kristen Draper. So at this point, I'm gonna open it up to discussion from anybody who'd like to chime in. Anybody have comments, questions? Um, I'm just gonna throw out there, um, when you were working on a resolution the only thing I remember commenting on was, was I don't want to come off this crass, but the prioritization, the, these kind of decisions that are going to have to be made at the state level um, regarding one tax, you know, one uh, asking entity versus another. And it kind of felt important to me that we we asked that they prioritize education in the grand scheme. That's correct, although I could put a... We could put a sentence in the introduction portion before the four points to ask them generally to prioritize. I liked that. I liked your suggestion and had put it in a redraft of the resolution. So it would be it would be a good idea to emphasize that, I think. The, the reason I was uh, I was feeling it wasn't needed because of everything that I, I hear is th that it is a priority from them and hearing what they, you know, hearing a, a state senator crying about uh, making some of these cuts, uh, I, I felt like it was, it was already at the top of the list. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of why I was just trying to get right to the point and, and why I was asking uh, Nate to get to right to the point of things that we thought uh, jumped out at, at as things that they could do to help us. I personally like the idea of this in a letter format um, rather than a resolution format. Um, it's a, I think it does underscore the fact that we know these state um, representatives and Senate senators are really are fighting for education and it's sort of, their hands are tied with this budget. Um, but it does specify what we, what 
they can do, and particularly asking for federal funding and referring 271 to the general election. I think those are very good two specific asks, and the next two as well. Um, but I, I do uh, kind of like the idea of putting it into a letter with those four priorities. Uh, so that's just me. In, in that case, can we do both? Can, can we, because you're, you're right, I had forgotten about that. Of course, we're not voting on that. So maybe put it in a resolution, but also um, do a cover letter such that we were going to do it with the federal one as well. Oh, it looks like Sandra's got something. Typical uh, to just vote on a letter. So I just throw that out there, but otherwise. Just a I'm suggestion fine with that just. Speaking, you can each one of you say you'd like your name to be on the letter as a signature. That way, you just all say, "Put my name on there," and you're done. Because you could do that anytime; it doesn't have to get on the agenda because you're not voting on it. Okay, Sandra, and then I. Well, the other thing I think we can do, frankly, is we can, in fact, vote on the letter uh, or the contents of the letter, and we can document onto the signature line as voted on by the Board of Education on what, 512 or whatever, uh, and go from there. Wanted to really quickly throw in one of the uh, sources that I used in putting together the resolution on the federal level was a letter from the Council of the Great City Schools. And at the end of that letter, the, it was signed um, by all of the superintendents of the schools, um, including Aurora Public Schools. Um, so it, I think that it is something that we could put together, and then we can electronically sign our individual names to if that is something that we wanted to do. I'm I'm a little surprised uh, that the CSI thing didn't jump anyone's trigger, and I, I'm kind of happy about that. Uh, and I just want to clarify that the reason that I I had brought that one up specifically is because uh, you know last Thursday they had they were going to cut uh, 5.5 million of that, and uh, when it got to JBC. It went back and forth, and they ended up only cutting 1.4 million of it because uh, the charter schools have done a great job of lobbying and communicating, and and so I thought that was a an important one to show that uh, we do see that and and we do uh, disagree with that decision, and we hope that we can voice that. Um, there, you know, there were tough ones that they did, like the best. Uh, grant program they took 25 million out of and um, I, I see that as a high need but I understand that they they're trying to get money for schools all over I just want to give background on that and make sure everyone was comfortable with that part of it Okay, so I heard a couple things. An idea I liked was Rob's that um, we would follow through with this uh, vote as is and just add at the end of the letter that it was voted on by the board, you know, whatever the vote count is. Um, does it seem about 
DJ Anderson. <laughs> DJ votes aye. Nate Donovan. Nate Donovan votes aye, and for some reason my camera is messed up. But I'm working on it. Thank you. Kristen Draper. Kristen votes Draper. Aye. Please, Jill. Christoph Fev. Naomi Johnson. Naomi votes aye. Rob Pedersen. Carolyn Reed. Rob votes aye. Rob votes aye. Motion passes 7-0. Christoph votes aye. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I know it's always it's always hard to know how much these actions we take as a board mean, but I do think in these kind of circumstances, getting ourselves coordinated and our language uh, put together is is meaningful, and being uh, able to communicate to the various uh, government entities and people doing the work is super important. So I, I personally thank all of you that did the work behind this. Okay, I think it, it will add up to uh, something. Well, will. Dave and Brett are both here prepared to uh, lead you through a discussion of what we're looking at. As of now, I, as of today, I think you all heard the prognosticating is significantly worse than the last time we talked two weeks ago. So um, so it will um, we'll be brutally honest and show you the numbers that we're looking at and what we are thinking about in terms of how to move forward with the district budget. So I'm assuming Dave or Brett, probably Dave, will go first. I think you're muted. I think I get the hang of this by now. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah, I'll, I'll be brief, and then we're going to turn it over to Brett, and he'll go through some of the high points of what was released today. But um, I believe most people probably at this time saw the the, the splash on the media. Um, the the budget situation is dire, and um, and they're looking at a 3.3 billion dollar shortfall. Um, you may remember multiple uh, board meetings we've been talking about a 3 billion dollar shortfall. So I think. To some extent, this is really bad news, but it wasn't necessarily unexpected for us as a district, and um, and so I think we're we're situated and poised maybe a little differently than than some others in the state, and that's that's good. Um, the the reality is, I think that this is the state's first pass at, at what this looks like. Um, we're also seeing that they're starting to look a little deeper at what's going to happen with property taxes, all sorts of other things that, um, that you know, that are in the uh, economic forecast that came out today. But the long story short is, it's a big budget shortfall, and it's going to be here a little bit longer than we were, than we were earlier talking about. And, uh, and right now, we're planning out a, a two to three year plan to deal with this. And, uh, and that may, uh, and that hopefully will be sufficient, but we may need to continue to modify and adjust as we learn more information throughout the coming months. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brett and he's going to walk through the presentation and uh, we're going to take a pause. It's going to be very similar to the last presentation. What we're doing is updating some factual information in here now. Um, and then we're going to revisit uh, the, the chart that we looked at last, last board meeting. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit. Uh, keep in mind, we will have Again, an executive session where we can talk about how some of these things play in and out with negotiations, which is something that um, that is also part of the budget story, but it's also part of the uh, negotiations as we move forward. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brett. Good afternoon, Dr. Smizer, members of the board. Uh, we're here to continue the conversation that we 
had most recently on April the 28th. So if everybody will remember what we talked about two weeks ago, the next big bullet point on the calendar that we were waiting on is May 12th. Um, so in an uh, unusual circumstance, both uh, the Office of State Planning and Budget and Ledge Council released an interim economic forecast today. Um, they came out uh, this morning uh, before lunch, and we've had a chance to go over them at a high level, not completely in the full detail yet, but definitely enough to start this conversation tonight uh, and then give us uh, time tomorrow to finish going through and analyzing. Um, as expected, um, the revenue decreases from both estimates uh, were pretty significant. Uh, if you remember, we had talked about a revenue shortfall in the range of two to three billion dollars being um, the talk. Um, both offices at this time are anticipating a revenue shortfall in excess of three billion dollars for both the remainder of the current fiscal year, the last two or three months, as well as uh, the 2020-21 fiscal year. Um, more than anything, while we have this information in, in hand at this time. This is what the JBC is going to use to continue their work as far as preparing a balanced budget uh, for, uh, for the legislature to consider for approval and go through that process. Uh, but more than anything, I would like to bring up the level of uncertainty that exists in both of the forecasts. If you go through and actually read them, they talk about uh, risk to the forecast um, and different kind of uh, things that could happen out there. And they say both offices, they say plain as day, uh, this is their best guess at a given um, spot in time. Um, as we've discussed before, there's no historical context for what this looks like in the United States. Um, and really, more than anything, uh, the state, I think, is attempting to position itself as well as possible to be able to remain nimble, specifically through the FY 2021 year, um, as well as further out. And I think across the state, that's what you're going to see K-12 local governments, uh, many of us that are in similar situations do as well. Um, in the interest of time, we're, we're really talking about uh, a multi-part series. You know, part one is just kind of getting through fiscal year 2021, and then we definitely have a long road ahead of us as far as getting back to normal and how that looks like in the big picture. And that's just about the finance side of it. And the reality is, while we remain, um, I don't want to say narrow focus, but while finance is my main focus in the district, there's many, many, many other people doing much harder work than this is the truth in response to the COVID outbreak. Uh, and there will continue to be in the future, given the uncertainty that's out there and how this will look as time goes forward. So on the next slide, we took a screenshot from the Legislative Council uh, presentation that they gave uh, in conjunction with their full forecast. So we have a slide for both Ledge Council and for both Office of State Planning and Budget. And we could have put together a spreadsheet and shown a whole lot of additional detail, but in its essence, this captures the problem. Um, this directly shows uh, the fiscal impact that's going to be uh, in place as a, as a result of the epidemic. And you can see that it's multi-year in nature, one of the items that we've been talking about. Uh, I think one of the areas um, around this that's probably a little bit of higher concern that was previously was the 1920 fiscal year. Um, Ledge Council is calling for almost a $900 million revenue shortfall in the current fiscal year alone. And the reason that is very concerning is that essentially wipes away the state's general fund reserve in one fell swoop. So at this point, when the state is planning for 2020-21 fiscal year, they're not planning for cuts and saying we're going to tap into our reserves. They're saying we have no reserves in place, so we have to cut to a certain number, and then we have to cut even more to start the process of rebuilding our reserves to get back in compliance with statute. So you can see the 7.2% the decrease compared to the March forecast for the current fiscal year. More important for this conversation is the 11.6% um, change for the upcoming fiscal year. And then uh, trying to look on the optimistic side, for 21-22, uh, at, at least at this time, they're anticipating the recovery uh, to be in effect in some way, shape, or form. Um, and as you can see, that bar 
but the bar for 21-22 is still lower than even the 18-19 year. So that is in no way getting back to normal, uh, being recovered or anything like that. But I think it's just important to note that we can see, with what we know now, a step in the right direction. Uh, but it's going to be a tough road to get there, to tell you the truth. So on the next slide, it's a little bit easier to read as far as an actual comparison. This is what Office of State Planning and Budget put out. So um, something I think that's really important to note about both of these forecasts is oftentimes they're very similar, and then sometimes they um, are a little more far apart as far as their assumptions go. These are very closely aligned, and I think that at least signals that from an economic perspective, uh, economists are broadly thinking the same thing regardless of what office, uh, state office they work in. And you will actually see, looking at the 1920 fiscal year, that Office of State Planning and Budget is anticipating a larger shortfall than Ledge Council. So Ledge Council was a $900 million approximate shortfall, and uh, Office of State Planning and Budget is estimating a $1.1 billion shortfall. Uh, that's really important because the current uh, reserve in the state general fund is approximately $900 million. So Ledge Council was anticipating ending the year with no reserves, and in this scenario, Office of State Planning and Budget would end the year uh, in effect with negative reserves. So they would have to do whatever the accounting mechanism is at the state level uh, to defer expenses or to do adjustments there uh, to make that whole for the current year and then start planning for the 2021 year. Um, you can see the similarities between FY 2021, 2.4 billion in OSPV. That matches the same number that Ledge Council had used. And then for the 21-22 year, Ledge Council is at 1.99 billion, and OSPV is at 2 billion. So essentially the same number uh, there. So with the exception of uh, the current year, both the upcoming year and the year after, both of the offices that issue economic forecast are in very close alignment. So I guess, if anything, that feels, we at least, we at least feel better that they're aligned. Uh, while the outcome and the budget reduction is not in any way a good thing or is not going to be easy to deal with, um, I feel much better than if one of the forecasts said a revenue decrease of $1 billion and the other forecast said a revenue decrease of $3 billion, that would obviously be a very large spread that would be calls for a lot of concern. So given given what we know there, we, we do at least feel, um, uh, the, feel good about the alignment of the two forecasts. So on the next slide, we'll go back into the timeline and update from where we were last time. So May 12th has came and it's almost gone. So the forecast came out today like they were supposed to. So we're in the process of finishing up the, uh, the analyzation of those and um, starting to see how those actual revenue reductions are going to impact the JBC, the work they're doing to compile the state budget, and specifically K-12. So the JBC started meeting early last week, I believe. So at this point, they're still meeting. They're really going to take these forecasts that it came out. It is going to be the numbers they use to develop the state budget, and they're going to start to, uh, to really move forward with a lot more decision-making and hard choices uh, here over the next week or two as they get ready for the legislature to reconvene. The biggest change since our last meeting was the legislature was scheduled to come back into session on May 18th or 19th. Um, just a day or two ago, they have postponed that until May 26th. So the reason that really impacts us is the point of them coming back at the earlier date was for them to be able to get the Long Bill and School Finance Act done by the end of May in hopes of uh, being able to have a budget adopted by then, which would really impact those of us that have uh, statutory deadlines to provide uh, proposed budgets by the end of May. I think they've realized at this time that that, that lift would be too large realistically uh, to get accomplished by uh, by the third week or so of May. So they postponed getting back together to give the JBC a little more breathing room to get, uh, to get some of these tough, tough decisions made. So what that means for us is at our uh, scheduled meeting on May 26th, we are going to go ahead and bring our proposed budget forward in accordance with statute, like always. Um, for the background, traditionally, school districts in Colorado don't make changes between their proposed budget and their adopted budget that their boards adopt in June. But this, for this issue alone, we're going to completely just specify up front 
Our proposed budget will be based on our best assumptions at the time, giving what we know at the last possible minute we can get everything put together to bring to bring and share with the board. Uh, be completely uh, prepared uh, for there to be uh, one or more iterations of additional budgets as we go through uh, regular and special meetings in the month of June to whatever extent is necessary for us to be able to get uh, you know the best information we have put forward for our actual adopted budget which has to occur sometimes by by June 30th so the real question after that uh, knowing that we're going to bring the proposed budget forward on May 26 is when will the Longville and School Finance Act be passed so if the legislature reconvenes on May 26, that only leaves four working days uh, remaining in May. I would think that it would be pretty unrealistic uh, that the May 30th date they were originally shooting for uh, could occur. Um, so I think realistically, we're talking first to middle of June uh, would probably be uh, the reality as far as when uh, the Longville School Finance Act um, would be finalized. So we'll keep everybody updated on that as we go forward uh, through our meetings as soon as we know more. But that's our plan as far as proposing the budget and then how we're going to move forward towards adoption by the end of June. So as far as what we're preparing for, I have the first two bullet points are just kind of broad takeaways from uh, one from each of the forecasts that came out today. And one of the things I would like to point out about the forecast is Oftentimes, they go into a little more detail about the actual expenditure side of the budget. They look at K-12, they look at health and human services and some other areas. These forecasts today, they felt very focused on the revenue side of the equation. So they didn't get into, there was there was no uh, no detail around K-12. We, we The reality is we have no more idea as far as what to really expect today than we did yesterday. All we know at this point with more certainty than before is the magnitude of the revenue shortfall uh, meets and in reality uh, probably exceeds uh, our expectations. So we know at this point what the state is going to be working with. Um, and then the real question that remains for us is, you know, how does that impact us? So, you know, the two takeaways from, from OSPB and from Ledge Council is we have been talking about two to three billion dollars. And I just want to point out that both of the forecasts, um, you know, just explicitly state 3.4 billion in one and 3.3 billion in another uh, revenue shortfall that they're going to have to account for in the upcoming year. Um, I mean, that's major. I mean, that there, there's no way around it. It is, it is not like a regular recession. It is not minor. It is not something they can uh, take a little bit of fluff out of the state budget and deal with. This is large, wide-reaching, serious stuff that will impact every corner of the state budget. And while we're obviously directly focused on, on PSD and what we do at the local level uh, for our kids here in town, um, Nobody is, I don't think, going to be immune uh, from the reality reality of this and, and how bad it hurts. Um, a real big takeaway in the second bullet point is Ledge Council called this out in their, in their analysis. So you'll remember from our pie chart uh, in the last meeting or two, the state general fund budget uh, is currently around $12 billion uh, worth of expenditures. Uh, so a $3 billion shortfall, I mean, that number's right. That's a, they're going to have to account for um, approximately 25% decrease in general fund expenditures uh, next year. Then the third bullet point, same, con same conversation we had before, we make up one third of the state budget. Uh, K-12 does with health and human services making up the, the other large portion. So from a, from a shared pain uh, perspective, if that were to be the approach of the JBC and the legislature, uh, one third of $3.3 billion is a billion dollars. Um, so we, uh, that's the high end uh, that we're preparing for that we'll go over in a little more detail here in a few moments. Um, so that it, it has the potential to re, depending on how um, JBC and legislature choose to approach the cuts, um, I'm under the impression they're not going to be necessarily across the board. Everybody takes their fair share. I think they're trying to look at it very strategically. Uh, the budget balancing documents that came out a week or two ago that we previously discussed um, showed that at least at the high level, they were taking a very pre uh, precision level approach as far as the cuts go. Uh, but as we talked about then, the pre pre precision level just goes towards getting the state budget in alignment with the March forecast. 
they're, they are now dealing with a very, very new reality, and it might take um, more drastic tools to get the budget uh, aligned than the methods they were, they were originally uh, using. So the last rule conversation you know, point is just the, the duration of the downturn. We had talked about two to four years before. Everything we're seeing, um, at least as of today, is still showing the same thing. So the reality is, you know, 2020, 21 is going to be tough. 21, 22, that would really be the second full year of the downturn, the third year if you're including the current fiscal year. Uh, the recovery is on the rise, so to speak. We don't have any modeling for 22, 23 fiscal year at this point. Uh, but I think we're talking at least 22, 23 to even get back to where we were in 18, 19, or 19, 20. So at that point, you know, we're going to, I think, realistically, we're probably talking a long, drawn-out process um, that will extend uh, over a number of years. So it's, it's, I don't, it's not going to be as quick uh, of a recovery as, as, as everybody would hoped for. And, you know, what we're talking about now is uh, an interesting fact I saw out of the forecast today where the state general fund revenue sources is made up of approximately 95% sales tax and income tax. So that would make sense if 95% of their revenue were from those two streams uh, with the mass number of layoffs and then the decrease in consumer spending that's going on. You know, that's really the driver of that. But I think there are, there are other long-term implications that we haven't had a chance to see yet. Uh, Dave mentioned uh, the property tax situation. 2021 is a reassessment year. The very delicate relationship between non-residential and residential and the Gallagher Amendment and a whole bunch of other stuff that I, I won't bore everybody with this evening all have potential uh, to come into play yet again and to put additional pressure on the state budget um, in the upcoming fiscal year as well. Um, so obviously, we're, we're dealing with what we know right now. Uh, we're expecting 2021 to uh, be a very fluid year, uh, both at the state level uh, and locally. We need to be prepared uh, for changes or adjustments in state funding as well with the realization that, that I don't think we have a complete understanding at this time what the long-term impacts of this are going to be. So on that, uh, before we go into the detail as far as what it means for PSD and the actual uh, budget figures that we're looking at, are there any questions around the state budget and assumptions that we've used uh, before we go into the actual options that we're entertaining to address the shortfall? Yes. Uh, not on the assumptions. I was, I, it was actually in respect to, to the options. So, ask. Okay. So, on our next slide, we will take, um, we'll take. Uh, the, the form that we used before has been updated a little bit, and we will kind of start there as our starting point. So a couple of, couple of topics and answer to a question or two before we kind of go into full detail. We had been talking about potential cuts in the range of 15 to uh, 28, $30 million as far as potential options for PSD. I think seeing the numbers today, um, while while the the work we did over the last month to get to this place um, were very tough, I do feel fortunate that that staff, uh, principals, and everybody we've worked with have done such a good job to have us well prepared at this point. Um, I do feel that we're better positioned than some of the others out there. So as far as assumptions and what we've been talking about, you know, we talked about we're planning on using flat funding for next year. Or excuse me flat funded people count. Uh, we're not going to use the, um, the funded people count increase that we had originally planned on. It was around 0.4%. Uh, that is an area of concern uh, for districts across the state. You know, what does this look like as far as October count goes? Do some kids choose to uh, stay home, to, to do homeschool, to do online school? You know, how does that look? Um, how does October count play? So that's one concern we have, and we're going to budget flat on that. As far as our worst case scenario, if the negative factor, or excuse me, the budget stabilization factor were to increase to the area that put PSD to base funding, 
um, that would be approximately a 13% or so increase from where the BS factor is right now. So for us, for PSD proper, that's uh, including our students alone, that would be approximately a $28 million revenue decrease over current year. And I like to point that out because whenever you look at the charts that are published by other groups such as CDE, um, School Finance Project, and others, oftentimes both district authorized charter schools as well as, as, well as uh, CSI charter schools are all lumped together. So for the topic or for this conversation itself and for the numbers we're talking, I'm talking about the actual funded people count that, that drives PSD itself and the numbers we're using to make our, uh, to make our decisions around that. Uh, the one other question I wanted to address that I forgot to put a slide in about is really around uh, funds and fund flexibility uh, that we have. And I think primarily the question that has came up is what is the interaction between the general fund, uh, mill levy override dollars that exist in the general fund, and then the capital projects fund. And when I say capital projects fund, that is the location where uh, the bond proceeds are from our 2016 election. Uh, that's the funds we're using to build the three new schools, the $40 million list, and those kind of things. So generally speaking, uh, the general fund is, is from a technical standpoint, the fund where you account for all your resources that are not legally required to be accounted for in another fund. But basically, it's where all the operations and general maintenance for a school district or, or local government occurs. So, you know, teacher salaries, uh, the, school, the, the items going on at the school level, all the way up to the central items that we've talked about before, uh, th those are accounted there. So if you think about the fiscal transparency sheet that we have shared with the board before, that's probably a good idea to think about. All those things on that sheet are what we account for in the general fund. Then as you get to a little more detail level within the general fund, we have a number of mill levy overrides. And those are specific items that we went to the voters for um, at a given time um, and, and asked for additional support uh, for those things. Uh, the most recent being the 2019 election being a good example. So as we look to the majority um, of the ballot language around mill levy overrides that we've done before, I believe all of ours have language that say, you know, we want to do these certain things, and then we have a blurb that says, including but not limited to. So as far as flexibility of real mill levy overrides, ultimately, especially for the newer overrides, we definitely, um, you know, attempt to work within the constraints of the ballot language um, and do exactly, uh, you know, what the voters intended with those funds. But we do have language that exists in those um, to allow us to change uh, from time to time. And I think a really good example of that being would be over time needs change and technology technology changes. So if you think back to, we could say, you know, the 80s or the 90s, you could have a mill levy that called for investment in typewriters. It would be a really good idea to include language, including but not limited to, because typewriters have become extinct. So by including that language in there, you can now swap to buying PCs or desktops or whatever the next technology thing is. So I think that's probably the best way to explain our mill levy overrides is they are dedicated. Uh, they exist for a certain reason, uh, but within, within reason, uh, we have the ability to look at those as times change, as circumstances change, um, as leadership changes. I think there are a number of reasons that would be valid points, uh, you know, to look at those from time to time. Uh, and the last real question is around the bond funds themselves, um, or I should say the capital project funds from the bond. So the ballot language for those called for uh, the funds are, are to be used for the purpose of acquiring, constructing, improving, equipping, and furnishing district buildings and other property. Um, so obviously we have several big ticket items. Uh, we have three new schools, uh, transportation facility, um, $40 million facility improvement list and others that are on there. Um, but the reality is um, if we get to the end of those projects and there are any funds left over, we have the ability within that language to use those resources to pay for qualifying items. So the best, anal the best analysis I can make on that is uh, we can use our capital projects budget that exists within the general fund as an example. We have approximately $1.7 million in the general fund that is used for those type items. Um, I would say primarily improving, equipping, and furnishing district facilities are what the general fund capital project dollars are used for, um, as well as purchasing vehicles. Um, 
which you can do with bond funds under the acquiring, uh, you know, acquiring property uh, or equipment language. So I think to the question that was posed is the reality is, as far as that goes, assuming you have uh, available funds in your bond fund, we have the ability to potentially, um, at least on a temporary basis, take qualifying expenditures from the general fund and push them to the capital projects fund um, as appropriate uh, within the constraint, the budgetary constraints of the capital projects fund on a short-term basis, uh, I think is the answer to the question there. So sorry to take too long on that, but we'll go back over to our, our worksheet now. So we've gotten a little bit further along in this process. So um, the probably one of the biggest updates from where we were at last time is the 6% central cuts. Uh, we got that process started in earnest last week. Um, what we did was within the total general fund budget, we had already extracted the schools uh, and their their piece of expenditures from the big picture for the SVB cuts that we were looking at, the 5%. So at that point, whenever we look at whatever's left over, it's really made up of two pieces. The first piece that's accounted for in the 6% central line item is all of the uh, staffing uh, that's not out at schools, as well as the operating budgets that support those people. So we're looking at cutting those 6%. If you'll remember before, we were looking at around $4 million uh, as our estimate there. As we've gotten further along in this process, we think 6% to central budgets is going to be slightly higher in the neighborhood of $4.3 million. So we have that information out to the executive directors and assistant superintendents at this time. Everybody's working with their teams. Um, I'm working one-on-one -on -one with those staff this week to go through scenarios that they're looking at, uh, how that'll look the relationship between staffing uh, implications as well as operating budget implications that exist there. And we're going to reconvene at the end of this week. I believe Friday is when we're going to be able to talk as a group about that, uh, the potential uh, you know, cuts there and how that will look to the district. So the second line item there, the teacher capacity, we talked about that last week, no change there. The next line item that I wanted to bring up is the last piece of the general fund. So we've already talked about the school cuts. We talked about the central cuts in the nature of both staffing and operating budgets. And the last item that exists within the general fund are what we would call centrally managed uh, program and restricted budgets. So this is where every budget that has a very specific perfect uh, purpose exists. So when you think about these budgets, think about um, a lot of the big ticket items we talked about. Our tech refresh budgets are in here. Uh, our textbook replacement budget is in here. The capital project budgets are in here. So budgets that exist for a very certain purpose, um, some of them are restricted in nature. Um, I will say bus fuel and snow removal. Those are items that as long as we're driving buses and as long as it snows, we have to do those things. Other items that exist in this budget uh, might, might be much more um, optional in nature. Um, and I'll say capital projects, because sure, you can defer maintenance for a while, you know, not necessarily a good idea, but that's options that we have within that, within that arena. So at this time, we're looking at probably around $600,000 of savings in those budgets. Um, good examples of that for the upcoming year would be, um, we know that we're not going to have, uh, or I say we know, at this time, I'm not aware that we're going to have an election this November. If we don't have an election this November, that'll be around $100,000 of savings that we can realize next year. Uh, we know at this point that diesel fuel is uh, probably going to be cheaper, at least through the fall, than it was in the current year. So we can decrease the bus fuel budget slightly over the current year. So that's just uh, two examples of items that we're going to do as we strategically go through and look at uh, savings there. That's really how the restricted budgets work. Um, as far as the program budgets, uh, a lot of those are very specific in nature, and we just basically as a district have to wholesale decide, you know, as a district, do we want to continue A, B, and C program, or is that something that we can potentially talk about not doing or not doing temporarily uh, as part as our budget development plan? Um, so you can see that, uh, you know, with what we have now for the 2020-21 year, we're looking at an ongoing savings of approximately $13.7 million. Uh, so as we talked about a few minutes ago, those conversations a month ago were very difficult. 
to tell you the truth. And the reality is, because we were probably a little bit ahead of the curve in this, um, you know, they, they were tough at the time. I think seeing the news today, I feel fortunate that we uh, that we got that process started earlier or later because I would hate to be having this conversation with the board for the first time today, um, you know, instead of when we started a month ago. So that's really where we're at as far as the ongoing cuts and the process there. Um, the biggest item really being the central cut. So we're going to finish working through that process and then have, uh, you know, a much more thorough report to give to the board at our next meeting. As we go to the one-time funds, uh, those are very similar to where we were at before. We're still talking about using the 2016 mill levy override, uh, you know, uh, for the first two years of the downturn. We have six million from the 2019 mill levy override that we're accounting for. And then assuming we get to our worst case scenario of around $28 million, uh, we potentially would have to tap into a small portion of the board contingency reserve for $800,000 plus the school and department carryover sweeps that we had previously discussed. So as we look at these, um, we definitely have a lot more work to do going forward. But generally speaking, I think we're fairly well positioned uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. As we get to the outlier years, you can see that that as things stand, we really only have flexibility for around $21.9 million. I think broadly that would closely align to at least the, the bar graph that Ledge Council had, where they're showing a recovery starting in 21-22, and, you know, how would that align to us? You know, we don't really know. I think as we look at the bigger picture, we want to remain aware of our resources and potential situation for 21-22 and beyond, but I think the reality is we're going to enter a new normal, at least for the short term, budget phase, whereas whenever we're in the actual 2020-21 uh, fiscal year, we're going to have to be doing uh, monthly and quarterly budget monitoring to an extent we've not done before. We're going to have to be remaining aware of uh, the economic forecast to a much higher degree uh, than we might typically monitor those when there's nothing strange going on in the economy. And more specifically, I think uh, we're going to have to start planning for the 21-22 year as early as July. I think the reality is, is as soon as we get this done, uh, adopted, while realizing there will more than likely be significant change to come even during the year. Uh, you know, by July, August, we need to be talking about 2021-22. We need to be talking about a lot of the pieces that due to time we might not uh, have gotten to fully explore as much as we should have. And by that, I'm talking, um, you know, looking at really uh, – the, the central budgets at a, at a greater level of detail, looking at those budgets that have no staffing tied to them, uh, especially around the program level, at more detail. Uh, and really um, really aligning uh, where our focus is as a district and specifics, uh, really around you know the district ends um, and making sure that we're targeting those resources to those areas. Um, and I'm even envisioning um, a little bit of budget renorming or zero-based budgeting to an extent on a number of those areas where we really take a step back and say, you know, hey, is this important? If it's important, we need to look at it this way. We need to look at it basically from scratch. I think it's going to be the reality on a number of these areas uh, and really make a long-term plan going forward. Uh, because while I would love to tell you we just have to take this on the chin for one year and life will go back to normal, I don't think it's fair to give uh, to give that assumption at this time uh, based on what we know. Um, so I feel like I missed a number of a number of highlights I was going to talk about around that. But uh, at this point, I think I want to um, let Dave comment if I missed anything of importance and then open it up for questions and, and go from there. You're muted. I'm learning. So as, um, as Brett, I think Brett did a very thorough job as always. So I appreciate Brett's... Uh, Brett's insight into this. He's uh, he's been thinking about it a lot, and I think it, it shows that we do have some thoughts available. Um, <clears throat> we uh, we obviously uh, we're kind of still midstream. We do want to come back with some more detail around the central program, um, central cuts. We're just not quite ready for that tonight, um, but I do believe we're we're well poised for at least what the foreseeable future is to us and. Um, and so that's about where we're at. 
you take any questions as far as this goes, uh, again, I would remind the board that we do have an executive session tonight where we can be talking more detail about where maybe some of these things intersect with the staff. Um, but the, the reality is, is that 80% of our general fund budget is staff. Um, and so that's, that's a, that's a big part of it. Just if, if, Brett, if you could just answer, um, what exactly are sweeps? Um, just if you could let us know what that is. So what sweeps are is, or let me just tell you how, what the normal situation would be, and then I'll explain. For most governments, school districts, uh, state, city, county, um, each year the governing body appropriates money for a budget. At the end of the year, whatever amount is unspent is reverted back to just the government itself, and it goes to the unassigned fund balance. With how we utilize site-based budgeting, or site-based management in conjunction with student-based budgeting in the district, we do a little bit different process where traditionally at the end of each year, however much budget remains uh, at the site-based control level, they get to roll that budget amount forward to the new year. Um, at the school level, it, uh, it plays into their compensation plan, and the reality is over time, they ebb and flow as far as some years they have a slight budget surplus, some years they have a slight budget, budget deficit, and that's why those reserves uh, exist. Uh, central departments operate very similarly, uh, especially around uh, some of the larger depart departments and capital projects where we allow that to happen, uh, where they can roll over budget uh, to use for large items or to allow them to save for things like that. So what a carryover sweep is, is we set a threshold. It's just a, just an equation that says, based on your original budget amount, any dollar amount over a certain percentage is going to be swept. So whenever we were looking at doing that this year, 10% uh, is the threshold that we use for the schools. Um, and then we used a more restrictive 5% uh, for the central departments to try to get a little more, uh, a little more mileage out of there. Some board members may remember that we did do carryover sweeps a number of years ago. Very different situation at that time, um, but they were they were hard challenges in light of uh, light of the news today. Unfortunately, I just don't think that the carryover sweeps have the spotlight. Yeah, I get, it's just a, it's a, it's really a request. I would like to see when we get, hey Sandra, when when we get the, uh, well, two things actually, one request and then a statement. The request is when we get the more detail on the central work. I'd like to understand explicitly the the usage of capital dollars. How much are we? How much are we? Uh, are able to use capital dollars in each of those years, or certainly in the first year or two, to offset some of the other costs that we're talking about here. Uh, so I'd like to understand that. The other thing that I want to say, uh, as a, in, by way of a statement, is I want to thank uh, Brett and Dave and the entire finance department and the staff, uh, central office staff that have worked hard on this, but I also want to thank the principals and the uh, staff at the schools uh, for the work in the budgeting that's been done. And I want to really extend my thanks to the entire uh, staff of the Poudre School District because really this is going to be, as we've talked about here, a very difficult thing that's going to happen over the next couple of years, uh, particularly and a change in the way we normally do things. And I understand that that's going to be hard. It's not going to be, well, change is hard anyway, but it's going to be hard because it's going to mean doing less of things that we think are very important for students. Um, and 
we really appreciate, I think, your willingness to engage in that process with us and help us to do the best we can given the resources that we have available. So thank you. Uh, also about the central office uh, and I just, I would like a little bit deeper understanding of what we are losing by cutting this. And so I wanna make sure that uh, it does, I'm not really sure how to, uh, you guys can present it better, but I, it, it's going into the details a little bit more of, of what these uh, cuts are related to, if they are um, just a budget that they have uh, for needs or, you know, is it certain people? Um, when I look through, you know, the adopted budget uh, sheets, you know, they don't give us a lot of detail. It just says, you know, integrated services or, you know, different stuff like that. I, I just want to make sure that we as a group are able to have understanding of what cuts are, are being discussed when we see the numbers in central office. And, and that's a great question. And what we've put together is a actual staffing and operating budget sheet uh, by assistant superintendent and executive director. So we actually know by department uh, what current compensation and operating budget amount we have. And we're using that with a couple of columns added to the right side to identify uh, what proposed staffing and operating cuts we're making. So we'll be able to give a full report uh, back to the board on the detail of that uh, when we get further in the process. Yeah, I, I, I just want to echo what Brett's saying too, is that we, uh, just because we are a learning organization primarily based on the classroom, we really put a lot of focus on supporting our principals in, in, the, in the, the efforts first, putting to some extent at, at a little bit of detriment, the central cuts on the back burner. We've since last, beginning last week have put full spotlight on that and working through that at diligent speed. So we'll be happy. Thank you. This is Naomi. Um, likewise, I'd like to get a little bit more information about what these cuts represent at the individual schools as well. I don't know if that's maybe the principals could just send a little blurb saying 5% for me means 3.7 FTE, 27 new desks, and whatever, um, just so that we have a, a, a clearer picture of what this, um, what this would look like across the district. I'd really appreciate that as well. Um, and, and I echo everything Rob is saying. This is um, really hard work that you all are doing. And I know that if I'm losing sleep over it, um, you all are probably losing more, although you look very refreshed. So um, it makes work sting. Work sting. I don't want to do this again. I'm going to ask in a similar question. Um, when you when you go uh, and you show us those um, that spreadsheet on there in year one, you take from the contingency reserves, I think six million, and then year two, I think from the board, uh, the board reserves, four point two million. So that's, that's a really good question. So what we're anticipating at the end of the current fiscal year is that uh, the board reserve will be around five million and the unassigned contingency, or excuse me, the unassigned reserve uh, will be right around 3%, which is around $9 million. 
So the background of the unassigned is that current board policy requires that to be 3 to 5% of operating expenditures in the general fund. So that's really the two flexible areas we have, so to speak. So we're anticipating a using these mechanisms to adopt a balanced budget for the upcoming uh, several fiscal years. So all things held constant. If we keep our unassigned reserves at the 3% level starting this year, we would anticipate roughly maintaining those at the 3% level uh, over the next several fiscal years, given what we know now. The harder question is the board contingency reserve. If we are required to utilize the board contingency reserve, uh, the full amount of it, which is currently 2% of operating expenditures over the next two years, that will no longer be there. And it would take a dedicated effort by the district uh, to put new money towards restoring those board contingency reserves at a future date. Correct, but what, I think one area to clarify, the $6 million unallocated one time, that money is not tied to our current unassigned reserve, the 3% level, that's separate. So the $6 million is unallocated from the 2019 mill levy override. So by utilizing those funds, we're not touching the 3% unassigned reserve, which is Will separate. Will it be possible to leave at 3% through this? even as you draw down six million dollars in year one the board contingency reserve is going to be drained if we follow this and it's, plan. i think it's important to, to keep in mind that, that we got to look at this over multi-years and and one of the concerns that i think that brett and i and others share at this point is that i think the state's done a good effort to take their best stab at what they think this looks like reality is that maybe even a little bit worse as time progresses and so so in those cases, we're still going to want to have some re reserves available um, because doing mid-year reductions are extremely complicated and hard. Um, not to say that we're not going to be looking at budget and be able to do that, but it just it may add us a little bit of breathing room if we need it um, mid-year. Hi, thanks, Krista. So um, I had asked a question earlier in the week, and, and one thing that I'm concerned about is I know that the um, counseling department um, gets a lot of their revenue from grants from the state, and I think that uh, about 25% of funding for counselors um, come from grants, and I think that total amount is about $909,000. So. If we lose all that grant funding, I'm really concerned that that department is going to be inordinately affected um, by the budget shortfalls um, because there is the possibility we could lose all that grant funding. Is that right? Yes, I think at this point, uh, at least from the first round of uh, Department of Education documents they had put forth as far as balancing the budget, they were looking at the very detail level, and that's one of our very big concerns is, um, you know, we have a number of grants and other items that would be impacted by changes there. I think the real question, which is very difficult because of the time crunch we're in, is when the legislature and the JBC gets to the magnitude of the situation, do they still attempt to do it at the detail level and then put a negative factor increase on top of that? Or do they just say, whoa, you know, given the amount of time we have and given the, the significant amount uh, of dollars we need, do they just apply it all towards the budget stabilization factor and leave those smaller grant programs and other items in place? And unfortunately, we just, we don't, I don't have any sort of a firm feeling either, either way at this point. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I'd just like to express my, I, I guess it answers my question, but I think it, it really drives home, I hope, for all of the board members that uh, we might have a really huge shortfall in that department. And I think that was one of the, one of our priorities for this going into this year was that we were going to um, put more counselors into, into schools. And, and now does it all, not only looks like we won't 
might not be able to do that, but we might lose a significant, significant amount of funding in that department. So I think we need to be uh, aware of that, that we could be looking at um, them losing 25% of their funding is what it looks like to me. Yeah, it's definitely something to pay attention to as it develops. Um, I tend to agree with the legislature, as I've seen it interact for multiple years in all its glory, often in the time crunch, takes the path of least resistance, of which will be the budget stabilization factor. But it could be a, it's going to be a combination of both for sure. So we'll have to pay attention to it all. Okay. Action. Yeah. Yes, I would be interested in seeing that. Uh, next level of detail like Brett was talking about and and as Naomi had had asked for it doesn't have to be very detailed but the next level of detail would be helpful I think yeah. and I also want to thank uh, the staff for all the work and uh, brain damage uh, it's been it's been good to help us get a handle on what's going on and uh, for all the uh, Pooter School District employees, I just thank them for their uh, hard work and their understanding as we face these, uh, these hard decisions. It's not going to be easy, and, uh, and hopefully we can get through it together. Thank you, Nate. And for those, I think Rob and Carolyn, those of you commenting, I, I wish our resolutions and our language upward could convey to those who are making. Uh, one of the things that um, staff would appreciate from you all is um, thinking about our, our proposals and our plans in terms of how comfortable do you feel with uh, risk. So do we, we are, we're making decisions about multiple years and we're looking at a combination of one-time funding and ongoing funding. And those choices about how much of each of those type of uh, funding over which year um, is, a, is our effort to manage risk is, is to use one-time funding and, and not um, cut too deeply, but we have to cut deep enough that, you know, one-time funding only lasts once and then just delays an ongoing cut. So as you're looking at proposals that we're bringing you over the next few weeks, be looking at, do, does the balance feel right? Because if we go too deep, um, we, we send a lot of pain right into the system next year. If we go too light, two years from now we're in big trouble because we didn't cut enough, deep enough, fast enough. And we're, only hindsight will tell us exactly whether we did it right or not, um, but those are, the, those are the balancing acts that we're trying to uh, communicate, and we're hoping you'll weigh in on that as well.
Um, I was going to say, as far as that mix goes, I think this spreadsheet makes good sense. And uh, it seems to me that going much below 50% for ongoing would be not a good thing. So I, so I like where we are in year two that we're, you know, two-thirds, one-third, two-thirds ongoing, one-third, one time. Um, I think if we got below 50% ongoing, that would be worse than uh, the other way around. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Um, just so as everybody knows, I, I captured a few thoughts. So we are looking for, uh, as we move forward, and I know on the 26th we're going to see the first actual budget, so we'll start seeing these details, but there's certainly a, a number of questions and comments were around getting a little bit deeper into the numbers uh, for board members to be able to better understand whether it was in the central office or the uh, school buildings, the, these decisions. So anything that we can do to get a little more there. Uh, Brent, you talked about the capital um, bond dollars and how they can be spent. Um, I think you did a good job of clarifying that. Any, any details there will be useful. Um, so just making sure that, that I try to, and then I, I think in the leadership will make sure we, break. we think through that as well. But I, I think we're, uh, th this is great. This is helping us. We're, we're coming along with you guys. And um, as you guys provide more details, I think we'll be able to keep up. So to both uh, Brett and Dave, thank you very, very much for your work and your presentation in leading the way for the board. And